and thank you to the CATS Center for inviting me to give this talk. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay, and start the slideshow. Oops, no. <laughs> All right, can you see my slideshow? Yes, perfectly. perfectly. That's great. And I'm going to set a timer so that I don't uh, overrun and I can know when I'm reaching the end. <laughs> so I'll do that right now. Okay. So rescue or ransack, unraveling the complexities of the Cairo Geniza chain of custody. I'm going to try and address uh, three questions today. And those are, how did the treatment of Geniza fragments by collectors and institutions obfuscate their chain of custody and perpetuate myths about this storied repository? How did the transfer of Geniza fragments from Egypt to Western institutions impact our understanding of the Jewish practice of Geniza? of storing away unused documents? And what does the Cairo Geniza discovery story reveal about Eastern and Western attitudes towards Jewish heritage materials? And here you, on the screen, you can see um, the iconic photograph of Solomon Schechter uh, in the old library at Cambridge. Uh, and this is him surrounded by the boxes of Geniza fragments that he bought out of, bought out of Cairo. Um, and really, it's the image that uh, comes to mind when we think about the Cairo Geniza and its discovery. Um, and Solomon Schechter is really the central figure of that story for uh, most accounts that we read uh, about the discovery. Um, but what tends to get overlooked a little bit is the history uh, the fact of there being uh, multiple collections of Geniza fragments around the world and some of their histories. Uh, and unfortunately, some of their histories of how they, they came about, how they were built, has often been subsumed into that uh, broader narrative uh, that has Solomon Schechter and Cambridge at the centre. Um, I've put together a, 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 a graph here to show you sort of that distribution around the world. And that you can see here the 12 main institutions that have over 500 fragments. You know, the largest you can see at the bottom there is Cambridge uh, and next to it, um, the Jewish Theological Seminary of New York. Uh, and after that, the British Library and then the Bodleian in Oxford, uh, the John Rylands Library in Manchester and so on and so forth. Not, not depicted here are another 13 institutions that have between 30 or 500 fragments. And then there are 28 institutions that we know about um, around the world um, that hold 30 fragments or less. And then around 19 or so private collectors that own or have owned uh, Geniza fragments. But despite this, the fact of all these collections and what we know about them so far, we still don't have an accurate uh, fragment count. Um, there's been wonderful work done by the uh, Freeburg um, Jewish Manuscript Society to um, digitize these uh, fragments. We have incredible work being done by various institutions, Cambridge, um, um, Princeton, uh, uh, digitization and description and cataloging. It's amazing work. And, and But you'll still find that the fragment count comes out fairly differently among those groups. And so the fragment count that I've given you here today is actually based on the National Library of Israel's catalog, which states that there are around 352,167 fragments. But even that fragment count has its own uh, difficulties. Um, um, and one of the difficulties is whether you count an item, i.e., a complete manuscript, a complete uh, piece that may have multiple pages or whether indeed you're counting pages. One of the other problems that we encounter um, is uh, with the whole uh, Cairo Geniza story spread around the world is that parts of the same book are often uh, spread across different institutions. And then there's also the issue um, that fragments from uh, sources other than the uh, uh, Ben Ezra synagogue have become mixed in uh, with the Cairo Geniza collections. Um, so if we look at what the, the largest of the collections, the best known perhaps, uh, the Cambridge Geniza collection, um, we can see that even it uh, does not come from one source, um, does not come from Solomon Schechter alone. Um, in fact, there were numerous sellers and donors that created the Cambridge Geniza collections. And here you can see them 
listed on this table here. Now, with regard to where they got their material, that's where we run into difficulties if we're trying to trace how all of this came about. Uh, and you can see from uh, the table, just for example, um, we know that uh, someone like uh, Greville Chester, who sold fragments to Cambridge, um, dealt with Cairo dealers. We know that he was supplied by a dealer or dealers, but we don't know anything about who they were. They're, they're completely um, anonymous. Um, someone like George Ellis, who sold a fragment to Cambridge in 1892. We still don't know anything about how he got his fragments. He also sold fragments to Manchester and to the Bodleian, and so on and so forth. You can see with each uh, former owner, uh, we, we run into problems with trying to trace uh, back to the, their suppliers. Um, one in particular, Elkin Nathan Adler, who you can see listed there uh, second from the bottom row, uh, his, his materials came from multiple sources, and I will dive into that a little bit further on. Um, the picture that you can see, the image you can see here, is an image uh, from the Cambridge collections. It's a ketubah. Um, it's dated um, 1028 CE, and it's a Karite ketubah. And it's from Jerusalem. It was written in Jerusalem. And it comes to us from a Jerusalem source. It comes from, um, it's the source is listed as Ephraim Cohen, who most likely was Ephraim Cohen Rees, who was a friend of Shechter. Shechter stayed with him during his visit uh, to the Middle East, stayed with him in Jerusalem. It's, it's very possible then that this fragment didn't even make its way to Cairo and actually uh, came from some... Um, Jerusalem, Geniza or repository. So that perhaps just gives you a little bit of a taste of uh, the complexities surrounding even just one collection and a well-known collection at that. Um, if we dig down a little deeper into tracing the ownership of these sub-collections, if we look, for example, at this one, which is the Agnes Smith and Lewis and Margaret Dunlop uh, Gibson collection, um, we can we can trace it back again so far to the local uh, environment, but we can't get further back than that. So we we know that today it's it's jointly owned by Cambridge and Oxford. Um, it was held in Westminster College for a certain period after 1899. It also lived within the uh, the ladies, the twins own home in Castle Bray. Uh, we know that they uh, acquired manuscripts from dealers in Cairo in the winter of 1897 when they joined Solomon Schechter. We also know um, that they acquired materials from dealers in Cairo uh, and in Palestine when they both visited both places in the spring of 1896. And again, when we look at some of their fragments, we can see that maybe Cairo wasn't necessarily the source. And here is a very good example for you of one of the pieces in their collection, which is a notebook um, from the year 1824, a little bit late for the Cairo Geniza, the Ben Ezra Synagogue. Um, um, and, and it actually was written in Jerusalem and the context, the content is Jerusalemite. And so most likely we can um, say that this would probably one that they acquired in Jerusalem. Um, and yet we don't know. Uh, we have, we, we can't go back any further than the fact that they were there. Um, and part of the problem with this, uh, part of the problem is, um, is the, um, that missing record, that missing information, that documentation between buyers and dealers in the local environment. And so here you can see a table that I've compiled um, showing um, the, the various um, uh, owners, uh, sellers, donors to the Bodleian Library's um, Geniza collection. And these are, these are six of the main suppliers. And what we know about them, we have the published catalogues, we have the TypeScript catalogues, we have library acquisition records, and we even have correspondence from the, these main figures to uh, the librarians. And so we can do, a, we can tell a lot from these records. Um, and, and I've been able to do that uh, to a certain extent in my own research. But then we hit a sort of a, a, a brick wall when we come to trying to see what was happening, how they got their fragments, who they got them from, how many fragments they got, um, the whole conditions uh, of supply, 
uh, purchase uh, and sale is completely missing. Uh, and then, and then, in some, even in some respects, some of the dealers all the information is me missing. So for example, you can see there, the second row from the bottom, um, A.E. Cow Cowley, Arthur Ernest Cowley, who uh, eventually became uh, the librarian of the Bodleian. And he previously worked together with Adolf Neubauer, who was the, um, the curator of the Hebrew uh, collection at the time that the Cairo Geniza fragments were acquired. So they worked together and Cowley worked on the a uh, catalogue of Hebrew fragments with Neubauer. So he was very involved in, in the whole acquisition of, of, of fragments. He too um, gave um, um, 247 uh, Geniza fragments items um, to the Bodleian. And there is no documentation at all as to how he got them, um, uh, how long they stayed in his custody and how they got to the Bodleian. So you can see there are a lot, a lot of gaps in, in the information concerning tracing uh, the transfer of the chain of custody. And part of the reason was that collectors and dealers often co conducted their purchases and sales in a secretive manner. They didn't want other people to know the sources um, and they wanted to keep their, uh, their suppliers exclusive. Um, and here, for example, is, a, is, a, is an example in one of the uh, records that we do have. Um, and this is the Bodleian Library record that uh, contains all the correspondence from um, Greville John Chester uh, to the Bodleian. Uh, and here you can see he writes uh, and he underlines, he says, pray don't on an open card mention of what the packet received consists as I believe they're apt to be stopped at the post office if the contents were known. And so he engages the librarian uh, in acts of secrecy regarding uh, the, the supply of Geniza fragments. In addition, part of the reason why we have this spread of fragments around the world is also due to what was happening on the ground. And we have some testimony to, to show that books, uh, or, or not even, not, whole books necessarily, but multifolio items were often broken up into smaller fragments. And this seemed to have occurred in a period after the uh, local dealers realized that there was a growing interest in fragments. And, and here, here is the letter that shows us that it's from 1895. Um, it's from the collector Archibald Henry Sace, who's working with um, um, a local uh, uh, um, a dealer, a Count Riamo Dulst, um, uh, who is trying to find the source of the Geniza fragments. Uh, and he seems to have discovered them in some old subterranean place, which again, they don't specify. Um, and, and it says, and he says that it's filled with manuscripts and books, uh, the lower and more accessible of which have been torn to pieces in order to sell the pages which have come to Europe. So we can see a little bit of how that whole spreading out of the fragments occurred. Uh, this is a letter that has uh, just recently come to light, um, which also uh, demonstrates that um, even though uh, it's rather frustrating at the lack of records, there are still records to be discovered. And this one was discovered by uh, a scholar that I'm, I'm friends with, uh, Michael Press. He's doing a lot of work on tracing the uh, trade of Hebrew manuscripts and, and antiquities, Jewish antiquities out of Palestine. Uh, and he found this um, letter in the Bodleian Library records in a, in, uh, a folder pertaining to um, Archibald Henry Sace's activities. And it really fills the gap uh, in what happened after uh, the Count discovered fragments in this old subterranean place and the next, the next stage uh, before they come to the Bodleian. Uh, and as Sace explains to the Bodleian librarian, Adolf Neubauer, um, one of your feasts, <laughs> i.e. Jewish festival, has occurred most inopportunely, inopportunely. And the house in which the manuscripts now are is crammed full of people. So it is impossible for the caretaker. So now we have an insight that it's the caretaker helping, the caretaker of the synagogue helping to smuggle out the fragments, it's impossible for the caretaker to smuggle any more of them out. It also lets us know uh, who the shipping agent is, how much is being sent, a box for, although we don't know the size of the box. Um, and we also know kind of the ways they're smuggling them out of the country, because uh, at this time, you are not allowed to import antiquities without them being inspected at customs and having a permission. 
Um, but it turns out that Mrs. Large, who works for the company Large & Co, is conveying the boxes to her agent as waste paper. So that's a really fascinating insight into the whole process. Um, and here you can see from the chart that I've made that there were a great many uh, activities uh, in, in, in uh, transferring Geniza fragments um, uh, that went through Palestine, starting right from the 1860s and going through uh, to the 20th century from um, uh, Palestine-based dealers such as uh, Solomon Aaron, Aaron Wertheimer to um, people who um, were at scholars who actually visited Palestine. Um, so a lot of activity uh, uh, doesn't come directly out of Cairo, but goes through uh, another uh, another uh, middle source. Um, fragments also were sent by mail. So Solomon uh, Aaron Wertheimer is one of the dealers based in Pal Palestine, who's uh, sending out packets of fragments to uh, institutions, largely uh, the Bodleian and Cambridge, um, and um, asking them uh, to review them and possibly purchase them, um, and um, and then getting back fragments in return, the fragments that they don't want. And here you see, for example, a letter that he says, uh, he writes back to the, um, the librarian in Cambridge, Francis Jenkinson, um, that, um, well, this, this follows on from another letter in which the, uh, he tells uh, uh, the librarian that he's, he's, uh, he's heard that package, a package of fragments has come back to him in Palestine, but that it's actually currently caught in Jaffa. Uh, and it's caught in the customs house and held by this Mr. Albert Zinger. And uh, the reason being is that Albert Zinger refuses to um, to transport it from Jaffa to Jerusalem without being paid. And so uh, poor old Wertheimer is going to have to pay in addition uh, to not being able to make the sale on his fragments. He's also going to have to pay for transporting these fragments back to Jerusalem. In addition to that, in this letter, and um, we also see that fragments have come back to him, but he's missing some. And so he says, number five is missing. He clearly labeled them. Um, and also, I did not find the 16 manuscripts, which I sent you uh, on in February. So you can see that the, this whole uh, process of, 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 of selling and buying fragments was fraught with danger for the fragments. Uh, it could result in all sorts of damage, environmental damage, uh, and as well also in loss. Um, these are um, screenshots that I took um, from the first version of the Bodleian Library's database of Geniza fragments. Um, they used to order things quite differently, and they used to be allow you to be able to see um, thumbnails, images of all the, the fragments. And this was very instructive for being able to have a to getting a visualizing tool for what the fragments looked fragments from different. Um, sellers in different periods look like. And so you can see the first one uh, on the left, uh, that's from Greville Chester in the 1890s, and the one on the right uh, came from through Sace in 1896. And you can see there's quite a bit of difference uh, in the condition of the folios that were sent. And also there's a higher number of multifolio items being sent in 1890. Um, just after the Ben Ezra synagogue has been um, reconstructed and the uh, Geniza chamber discovered through to 1896, where they seem to have disappeared uh, and they now seem to have been hidden in some subterranean place. Um, I um, uh, compiled all the data from uh, the two catalogues, the Bodleian Library catalogues, every single piece of information from those catalogues, and I put it into a spreadsheet to see if there was any way of discerning changes over time and the impact um, of the uh, transfer of fragments uh, on the fragments themselves. And here you can see a little bit of what's happening. And so if you go from the front uh, uh, um image to the back, you can see the, the changes that have occurred. So you can see that over time, uh, there's less vellum being supplied and more paper. You can see that um, the physical state is not too, too terrible at the beginning and gets worse towards the end. Uh, similarly, you can see a large amount of staining occurring over time. Um, uh, and that's just one way of visualizing uh, what's happened, although it's not the complete story. 
Now, the collectors themselves, uh, the stories they told about their collections um, added to this uh, perpetuating myths about the whole Cairo Geniza story and discovery. So I'm going to tell you about the curious case of the 35,000 plus collection of fragments that fit into one sack or several Torah mantles and the four boxes of fragments that filled one bound volume. Um, and here I've supplied some images to give you a visual sense of what a sack might look like and what a box of fragments might look like, etc. So the story is the, of the Elkin Nathan Adler collection that is now held in the Jewish Theological Seminary of America um, and is being uh, scanned and digitized and, and, and described by uh, the Princeton um, Geniza Project. So some great work going on with this collection. Um, most published accounts of this collection relate that the bulk of the collection came when Elkin Nathan Adler visited the Ben Ezra synagogue in 1896, in January 1896. And this is the story that he tells himself. So we, and he tells that he acquired a sackful. And so we're supposed to imagine that these 35,000 fragments fit into one sack. Um, and here you can see um, I've I've pulled out poor old um, Benjamin Richler uh, as an example of a standard account of how of how the Adler uh, collection is described, and and you can see that he 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 talks about how he visited for three or four hours, um, and then uh, uh, most of these leaves were acquired during that time, and then there were about six thousand leaves uh, that he acquired. Uh, the Bodleian librarians, uh, through the Bodleian librarians who had considered it as waste. Um, now, when I read this, I thought, well, that that whole story about uh, Adler um, acquiring fragments from the Bodleian, uh, from the Bodleian waste um, was something I discovered. Um, but I don't remember saying anything about there being 6,000 leaves. Where has that come from? Anyway, well, we'll get there. Um, when we go to Adler's own account of how he acquired these fragments, you can see that he changes his story slightly and maybe significantly um, over time. Um, in 1897, not long after he'd acquired uh, his first sack full of fragments, he talks about the whole experience. Uh, and he says that he acquired a sack full of paper and parchment uh, in the three or four hours that he was permitted to linger there. By the time he comes to write, uh, talk about it in a lecture and write about it for the Jewish Encyclopedia in 1904 and 1906, he's talking about it as a sort of a joint effort. Um, it's a sack that he's allowed to take away with him that he and the rabbi together had gathered in about three or four hours. By September 1909, he has an interview for the Jewish Chronicle, and he perhaps lets down his guard a little bit about what he tells about this story. And at this point, he confides that um, he crawled into some recess, which actually doesn't sound like the Geniza we know, because you have to go up a ladder and down into a hole, but he crawled into a recess, so that's very interesting. And he stayed there until the rabbi lost his patience. And when he got out what he got out, they actually had to put it into old mantles of Sforim because they had no, they didn't have a sack handy. So that's a very interesting uh, little insight into what went on. Um, and then uh, finally, by the time he publishes his own catalog of his own collection in 1921, he goes back to telling the story of it being a sack um, that he was permitted to take away. So if we look a little bit at his uh, catalog, what he tell the story that he tells there, there we can see he expands it slightly. <laughs> Um, and not only does, did he acquire a sack full of fragments from the Cairo Geniza, but he also acquired fragments um, from um, uh, Palestine, uh, Geniza in Palestine, and a Geniza in Alexandria, and specimens of a scroll from the Geniza um, in the Crimea. When he describes the Geniza fragments in the catalog, he describes them as either from the Cairo Geniza, which is an attribution he gives only to one entry, or from the Geniza, 21 entries, or in the case of most of the entries, he simply writes Geniza. There are three other sources for his Geniza fragments uh, that he mentions in other accounts, but he does not mention in his catalog, the Rosetta Geniza, Palestine-based dealers, and the Bodleian sale of waste. As for the Rosetta Geniza, um, he tells about that in his 1905 uh, book about Hebrew manuscripts. 
and he tells this whole story of how he he convinced uh, uh, um, the locals to help him dig it up uh, in the middle of the night, um, and um, how he um, recovers uh, uh, important fragments uh, from rescues from the grave. He 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 describes it uh, important fragments of early manuscripts, uh, and here you can see. Um, one of the fragments in his Geniza collection that is designated as coming from the Cairo Geniza. It's a Cairo Geniza fragment, but in fact, it's a ketubah from Rosetta, written in Rosetta in 1785. And so it does seem more likely that this was one of the fragments that he dug up in the middle of the night uh, that actually came from Rosetta. Now, he, as, as I said, he also acquired Geniza fragments through purchases from dealers based in Palestine. He had uh, dealers that he worked with who who traveled and, and found him uh, important manuscripts. But there were people who, uh, such as Samuel Rafalovich and his partners, who who traveled around Europe selling Geniza fragments uh, from, 19, uh, from 1898 through to the 1900s. Uh, and here we can see a letter where he's Elkin Nathan Adler is having a little bit of a disagreement with Solomon Schechter about uh, who has first refusal over um, a bag of uh, uh, fragments being offered for sale. Uh, and, and Elkin Nathan Adler says that really what they need to do is come to an agreement whereby they, <laughs> they take fragment by fragment in succession. Um, it doesn't sound like that's what happened in the end. It sounds like uh, Solomon Schechter actually managed to get the, uh, the, uh, uh, the lion's share. Um, but anyway, you can see how he acquired some of the fragments. Although, as I said, this is not at all reflected in the record. And then we know um, uh, that the, the Adler um, acquired fragments from the Bodleian. These were fragments that were first excavated for the Bodleian by that same figure that was helping um, Archibald Henry Sace in 1895, uh, comes to help the Bodleian again in 1898, conduct excavations in and around the Ben Ezra synagogue in Fustat. And here we have a letter from the Bodleian Library records uh, from the Count, Count Riamo Dolst, uh, uh, giving a final report of his activities, of his excavations. He says that he's been working for 55 days. He gives the amount that it's cost that he has forwarded from his own money and needs to be reimbursed as 27 pounds, 16 shillings and eight pence. Uh, he tells that the result has been 16 big, gra big grain sacks full of fragments, which have been packed in four big wooden packing cases and handed over to that uh, large agency. Um, when we look at um, some of the Bodleian Library's own uh, reports, published accounts, we can see that um, once they acquired these uh, uh, fragments, these four boxes of fragments, they discovered that they didn't really want them. Um, uh, they weren't terribly impressed by the contents. Um, and so it was decided that the um, the amount expended to purchase these fragments uh, would need to be reimbursed through uh, selling the fragments on uh, and that they sold them uh, to a private collector. And here we can see um, I managed to trace this uh, this sale uh, in the body and library records um, in one of their accounts, the receipts books. Uh, and and the the account is labeled sale of waste, um, and here you can see it. You can see that um, it was it was described as a sale of useless Hebrew manuscript fragments, and the buyer was Elkin Ad Nathan Adler, Ian Adler. Um, but he doesn't make just one payment. He make uh, he doesn't acquire. It's not just one acquisition. It's three. Uh, so he acquired fragments in 1898, in 1899, and in 1907. And the amount of payments tells us that uh, these were the, the waste uh, materials from the first uh, shipment of fragments in 1895, from the second shipment of fragments uh, um, in 1898. And finally, through uh, from another shipment that the uh, Bodleian got in 1906 from a collector called Joseph Offord. And Offord sent them a box of fragments uh, in 1906 uh, they kept 700 of them uh, and sold on the rest to Adler. Um, so the library was able to recover all of its funds and Adler now became uh, the owner of 
X number of fragments. Uh, um, and here we shall see part of the problem of being able to uh, uh, determine how many fragments he acquired. So if we look at uh, where they came from and how much we know about how much there was there, uh, we can see uh, and, and where we, we sort of lose information. So um, for this first uh, sale um, uh, in 1898, um, we know that it came, as I said, from the subterranean place in 1895. It's sent to Oxford in December 1895, and it's described as a large box more than a metre in length and half a metre broad. Out of that box, the Bodleian kept uh, 1,108 items. Um, and then it sold on an unspecified number to, uh, to Adler. Um, and then the next uh, line, we see that uh, during the excavations carried out by the Count in 1898, uh, at, that, at that cost of 27 plus pounds, um, that was packed, as we said, in 16 big grain sacks, that sent off in four big wooden packing cases. And then we see at the very end of it, all that is retained is just 15 items um, that are uh, uh, put into one, just one volume, and the rest is sold on to Adler. And then finally, this uh, Joseph Offord uh, collection uh, that is described as, a, as being sent in a box. Bodleian retains 713 items and then sells on the unspecified number. So this whole obf obfuscation of the chain of custody leads to, I'm afraid, additional errors in scholarship, uh, mea culpa. Uh, and I've, I've titled this, or why Rebecca Jefferson should never apply math to Geniza provenance research. Uh, so back in uh, with my youthful enthusiasm, one of my first articles that I wrote about this whole process of the excavations uh, um, conducted on behalf of the Bodleian, I was trying to, I was very frustrated by this whole visual problem. I'm a very visual person, and I couldn't imagine the 35,000 fragments uh, being stuffed in, into a few Torah mantles. And I was trying to figure out how much Adler had actually purchased. And so I thought, well, if I can... Think about how many fragments go into one of the boxes of the Mosseri collection at Cambridge, which we have. Um, I can I can I can extrapolate out from that how much would be in a box that's a meter uh, meter wide, meter tall. Um, and so I did this whole mathematical formula um, where I came up with the idea that there were uh, that the uh, box contained nine thousand six hundred fragments, and therefore Adler probably. Um, uh, acquired 6,000 fragments. And so mea culpa, it's my fault. that uh, It is now being repeated um, uh, in guides and catalogues um, that uh, the 6,000 fragments, 6,000 fragments in the Adler collection uh, came through the sale of waste. And I, so I, for the record, state that I have no idea that that is, is necessarily true because tiny crumpled fragments can fill up multiple spaces within the box and really impossible to calculate. But I hope all of this is giving you a sense of the problematics of, 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 of the whole Geniza discovery story, story and its transfer uh, to institutions around the world. So in addition to his sack of fragments from the Cairo synagogue, this is what it actually kind of looks like where the sources for his collection. So you can see I've put in there now the Rosetta Geniza and the Bodleian sales of waste uh, over time. And there in the center, you can see one of the teeny tiny fragments in the Adler collection. Uh, it is a collection that's very fragmentary, uh, really just um, small pieces for the most part. Um, and so you can imagine that um, a lot of these came from these various sources. And so it wasn't just collectors that, um, uh, that created this whole uh, problem. Institutions did it too. And th some of their record keeping uh, was less than perfect because they too were trying to keep their suppliers uh, hidden from competitors. And in this case, this is um, a draft to an addendum to the uh, catalog of Hebrew manuscripts after the Count Riamud Alst complained, I'm not mentioned in your catalog, my work is not mentioned. And so they corrected the catalog in 1910. Uh, and then the, the librarian um, Nicholson uh, tries to, uh, to reassure uh, the readers <laughs> and, and the Count that it was really because absolute secrecy was necessary at the time for the interests of the library. 
So there's, so here we go again uh, with the institutional records uh, helping to perpetuate these myths. And I'm going to talk about the curious case of the six sacks and three bags of fragments that fit into just one Geniza folder. And if you're wondering what a Geniza folder looks like, I'm, I'm really talking about um, a, a folder uh, uh, from the Cambridge Geniza collection. And here you can see one pictured there uh, on the right. So this concerns a sub-collection within um, uh, the Cambridge Geniza collections, uh, and it's a sub-collection that's rarely mentioned um, and is only really mentioned um, uh, in sort of the, the guides to the collection. And also by, it is mentioned by Benjamin Richler, who I'm, um, uh, oh, that's my signal to hurry up. Um, Richler mentions it in his catalog again. And he says that the uh, the collection that came from this figure, uh, Enrique, um, is now preserved in box um, uh, TSNS172. So one folder of the Geniza contains this Enrique collection. And here you can see uh, is a fragment from that box 172, and it's a war calendar from 1695. And unfortunately, the database, the Geniza database, uh, actually gives the provenance as Solomon Schechter, which is which is definitely not the case. Um, um, if we dig into the institutional records and the co uh, correspondence and re reports, um, we can find the letters from Enrique and we can see how he actually sent six sacks and three bags of fragments from Cairo in 1899 uh, and 1902. And digging into the um, archives of the Taylor Schechter Geniza unit, at Cambridge University Library, we can get a sense of how how these um, uh, sacks and bags disappeared into the collection. And so you can see uh, in one of the uh, handwritten inventories, we can find a note in the box that say they were part of a collection brought from Enrique Enrique. Um, and again, here is another typed inventory from the uh, the unit's archives. And uh, here we see all sorts of strange entries like uh, unlabeled question mark, not TS, uh, library collection, not TS, February 1902, and even labels such as rubbish to be examined again. Um, and so it was really um, not until um, uh, the wonderful Stefan Reif uh, built the um, um, Geniza Research Unit uh, in the 1970s, that a lot of sorting and cataloging and labeling went on. Um, and, and he is not to blame for this process. This is an earlier process actually, uh, whereby uh, fragments got sorted into new series. Um, and, 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 and that's probably why the Enrique shipment disappeared. Um, here's an example uh, of a piece um, where the Cairo Geniza Geniza provenance is, again is assumed because the institution simply doesn't remember or hasn't recorded uh, where the fragment is from. And so here you can see it's actually a um, uh, Kituba from Morocco. It's dated 1848, may never have been in Cairo, but still uh, it's a fragment. It's with all our other fragments, it must be from the Geniza and hence we'll label it as such. Now, the idea of rescuing the fragments from collect collect uh, from Cairo uh, was often used uh, as a means of justifying uh, collecting the fragments. And here you can see it spelled out very clearly by uh, Moses Gaster, who was another collector. His collection is in the John Rylands Library uh, and in the British Library. And here you can see he, he actually writes quite openly that he convinced uh, locals that they shouldn't keep their books in their own house because they'll become lost or consigned to oblivion. Um, and they must hand them over to him because in his large library, they will not become lost and they will be protected. Um, but as you can see from this piece here, unfortunately, there was um, a fire um, uh, in London. And uh, when the fire was um, um, put out, the water that put out the fire did a lot of damage to the Gaster collection. And so you can see that um, this notion of rescue was not always uh, the case. Um, some Geniza collections were sadly uh, destroyed uh, after they were rescued from Cairo, and that's the sad case of the collections, many of the collections that were in Germany uh, and disappeared uh, during the Holocaust. Uh, 
some collections are and uh, were and still are annex, uh, uh, difficult to access or completely inaccessible. This one uh, in the Institute of the Peoples of Asia um, um, it is difficult to trace because the institution itself changed its name and was relocated six times. Um, I apologize for speeding up, but I'm aware of the time. Um, right, actually, I'm coming a little bit over time. So uh, I, I'll, I'll go very quickly just to let you know that um, some of the records give us insights into the prices that dealers um, were asking for fragments, as opposed to the prices they were getting, giving them further insights into uh, how these uh, fragments were valued. Um, um, if we look at current prices, uh, these were fragments are being offered for $45,000. You can see how that there's been a shift in uh, Western thinking about um, how these uh, fragments um, are, are pieces of, of Jewish heritage that should be rescued. Um, and then local uh, perceptions of the uh, fragments also changed. Uh, this is a letter from the Grand Rabbi of, of, of Cairo to Solomon Schechter in, in May 1898, uh, promising him a further two sacks of fragments and letting him know that conditions on the ground have changed. And now they've come up with a new sense that, um, that permission will only be given to appropriate and deserving visitors. Um, and um, they will not acquire things for trade only to expand knowledge. Um, here is a piece from the uh, 19th century um, that has no indication of, of where it's from other than it says it's from Mitzrayim, from Egypt. Um, but it's automatically um, described as coming from Fustat because, again, those that whole Geniza, Cairo Geniza uh, uh, myth, mythology um, um, leads to the perception that everything that uh, uh, doesn't have a location must have come from Fustat. That might even extend to some of the pieces that we have difficulty explaining away in the Geniza collections, such as non-Judaic materials, uh, items of Coptic manuscripts, um, um, copies of the Quran. Um, this may be obscuring this whole Geniza uh, idea of a one source, never emptied repository, may be um, um, obscuring the actual origins of these fragments. Ooh, so very quickly, um, let me see. Was it ransack or was it rescue? Well, um, what's the time? I want to be quick, really. Ah, yes, okay. Um, so uh, many circumstances, discovery and chain of uh, custody was poorly documented as I've tried to demonstrate. But on the other hand, um, uh, these, connect these collections have enabled scholars to reconstruct amazing worlds that were lost, rebuild um, uh, histories of Jewish community life. Um, on the ransack side, uh, we can see that poorly documented discoveries can lead to false assumptions and incomplete or misleading historical records. Nonetheless, the recovery of the these materials has transformed knowledge of Jewish life in the Middle Ages. Um, the transfer of materials through dozens of dealers and collectors across time has inflicted further damage and deterioration on the fragments. On the other hand, important fragments of Jewish life revived through conservation techniques that were developed in these Western institutions. We've seen that collections of fragments were lost or destroyed, as in the case of Germany. On the other hand, major institutions are investing large amounts of time and funding to housing, cataloging, preserving, providing access to the fragments. Um, we see that community members gave away or sold fragments for little or no monetary gain, and yet today's collections are worth millions. On the other hand, interest, interest in buying and acquiring fragments help the local Jewish communities realize the importance of their uh, papers. Um, community members made the decision to hide and bury these materials, and they did not mean for them to be recovered. On the other hand, <laughs> rescue of remnants of Jewish heritage, materials that otherwise might have been lost or abandoned by communities that later got exiled, particularly from the Arab lands. Um, and finally, these materials belong to the local Jewish communities that created and stored them. And you could make the argument that really they should have remained in situ. On the other hand, <laughs> We now have today major digital initiatives, such as the one spearheaded by the Friedberg Geniza project, uh, as well as individual institutional projects that have enabled global access to these fragments. 
uh, that would have otherwise been difficult to or impossible to consult. And so that's where I end. And I'm so sorry for the race through to the end. And I hope we have time for questions. Thank you so much. This is really illuminating. Um, in a moment, you can stop sharing. Maybe, maybe leave that up just for another moment in case people want to make their way through um, this really fantastic final slide. There are already questions, and um, the, the, so I want to make sure we have time for them. The, the first thing that I want to ask is um, reflected in a bunch of the questions that have been submitted. That basically your whole present presentation, and and even beginning from your earliest slide, showing even just the sellers and donors to the Cambridge collection explodes the image and the myth, right? That most of us probably come with of the Geniza as a kind of time cap, pristine time capsule that was like closed until it was opened and now brought to, brought to the West. So um, that's already amazing. And, I, and what I wanna ask is if you can back up a little bit and just maybe describe in brief in a minute or, minute or two, the early, history of the discovery. So so if it isn't that there was a closed room, one person walked in and started taking things out, what was it? Were there multiple receptacles? Were there multiple sites? Um, who was caretaking them? And how did people begin bringing the items out in the very beginning? Okay. <laughs> It's a little bit difficult to trace as well. Um, we have uh, one important account from 1860, that of Jacob Sophia, a Jerusalem collector and dealer, um, who describes um, uh, accessing the Geniza or a Geniza through or on the rooftop of the Ben Ezra synagogue. And he uh, is uh, his his account is often repeated because although he himself didn't come away with anything much, he speculated on what wonderful things might lie beneath. And that has always suggested to scholars that he saw the Geniza, this repository that Solomon Schechter found. Um, and, um, but uh, I, uh, having analyzed his language, I have come to agree with another uh, scholar, Nehemiah Aloni, that actually he saw one of the many storage spaces in and around the uh, Ben Ezra synagogue. And he actually saw uh, a box on the rooftop and he didn't see what Solomon Schechter saw. Now, uh, after that, it goes a little bit quiet. We know that fragments are, are, are circulating somehow. Um, but uh, the next thing to happen is that the Ben Ezra synagogue is restored uh, in um, 1899. It's actually brought down to its foundations and built again as an exact replica of the medieval building. Um, at that time, um, we have an account uh, from someone who was on the site as the building was being dismantled, and that was Greville Chester. And he writes that he saw a room laid open uh, with the floor covered in manuscripts. Um, uh, and then uh, we have the next account is not until the 1920s that supposedly comes from a local account that tells us that the fragments lay in the in the in the synagogue yard for many weeks and dealers helped themselves to it. And that's how we got the fragments that came out to us. But that's an account from the 1920s. We have the Chester account. And then the next thing we have are records from 1895 um, when um, Count, Count Riamo de Dalst is going looking for the bodily and for the source of the fragments. After the Ben Ezra synagogue was rebuilt in 1892, uh, the, the source seems to have disappeared. Um, and so he's looking for it. And so the next account we have in 1895 is of this strange subterranean place. Um, and so the Bodleian starts to get its fragments from this place. Um, the next thing we have is, is El Canadla, who doesn't tell us very much about what he saw. In fact, that's a whole mystery. He was somebody who shared a great deal about his adventures, and yet he never shared anything about what the magnificent sight he must have seen when he went into the Ben Ezra Synagogue Geniza chamber. The next account we have, of course, is Schechter. So, and Schechter goes there, and there's this hole in the wall and this massive uh, collection. But, but as I always try to point out, that was what was there after the building was rebuilt. That doesn't necessarily reflect what was there before the building was rebuilt. 
Now, another um, another source is the Bassettine Cemetery, the one of the, the second oldest Jewish cemetery in the world, and that was used as a site for uh, the burying of fragments uh, for a long time. It seems like it might have been disrupted for a while in the Middle Ages. It's not clear. Um, Elkin Nathan Adler even says in his description in the Jewish Encyclopedia that a large amount of Schechter's collection came from the Bassettine Cemetery. So, and we've even had actually fragments emerging from the Bassettine Cemetery uh, in recent days, uh, recent times. So that's another source. Um, I mean, uh, it's very, very, very complicated. <laughs> And and there's even accounts of 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 Geniza's, uh, in, in Palestine and in in, in other countries uh, in the Middle East that could have been once this started to become a thing and people were aware that there were important fragments to be had and 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 collectors and dealers were were searching for them. Um, I think it became uh, uh, dealers on the ground were looking for these in in multiple places. Oh, and I should also mention, I'm very sorry, this is such a long explanation, but it's such a complicated story. Um, but there were other synagogues in, 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 in Cairo, in Egypt, that were also renovated around the same time as the Ben Ezra synagogue, um, particularly the Mahala al-Kubra, uh, the al Shati uh, synagogue in Mahala al-Kubra, um, which, which um, must have had uh, an important Geniza and that disappeared after its renovation. And so I, my own sense is that a lot of things went into the mix. Uh, um, so I'm sorry, that's a very long way round of- uh, No, that's fantastic. Yeah, it, it further explodes what I, what I thought I was even asking about. <laughs> um, there a number of people are asking in different ways also about whether this, um, wh whether the, the faulty provenance that's listed and whether our kind of flawed understanding of the, of the origins of these materials has, created problems for the scholarly understanding of the materials themselves, right? So do, do you think that um, mislabeling where these items have come from and or the breaking up of them ha have led scholars to reach, to reach wrong conclusions or to analyze them in, incorrectly? To a certain extent. I mean, it cannot be denied that, you know, as I said, on the rescue side of things, massive treasure has <laughs> um, really revolutionized scholarship. Uh, the Geniza scholars are doing fabulous things. And for the most part, the content is the content. I would say it was when you, when it doesn't quite align. So, for example, with the, uh, the um, ketubah from Rosetta, if you assume that it was placed in the Cairo, in the Geniza, in the Ben Ezra synagogue, then you've got to build a story around how this ketubah was used and stored and kept and preserved and how it ended up in the Ben Ezra synagogue. You have to build a whole story that may not be true. You know, I mean, maybe that that item's whole story is in Rosetta <laughs> mm -hmm. not, and has nothing to do with uh, the Cairo community. Um, and similarly with many of the sort of later pieces and the printed pieces, and maybe even with some of the medieval pieces, like, for example, I often think when I, I hear about uh, copies of the Quran, we have to tell the story. Well, we have to tell multiple stories about copies of the Quran, about ways Jews might have been interested in having copies of the Quran. Well, what if they weren't ever in that Ben Ezra synagogue, you know? So that those are some, I think they're questions that we need to start raising. They might not necessarily be the answer. And as I said, the content may be the content and it's fine spot may not be significant. That's, thank you. That's a very, very helpful answer. Um, what, can you talk a little bit more about what standards um, the early Westerners were using to determine what was rubbish, what was valuable. <laughs> what did they think of as being a manuscript that they wanted versus not not right. versus selling on or or trashing? Yes, well, it seems to be that uh, obviously the 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 more substantial the manuscript was, uh, that was important. Uh, the uh, The collecting of tiny fragmentary pieces only became something people did later, or found value in. Um, the material was something, if it was vellum, that was often prized above um, of, above 
uh, paper fragments. Um, and really, though, mostly this idea of recovering monumental works of important books, um, uh, copies of the, the Bible, but uh, even more so copies of rabbinic works that could help fill gaps in the history of that literature. Um, monumental pieces such as uh, important figures in Jewish history, such as Maimonides uh, fragments. Items like that, it, it was really the things that we consider today so fascinating and so important, things like shopping lists, <laughs> fragment, fragment, didn't come on the radar of these uh, Western scholars to begin with. They weren't really interested in the everyday life of, of, of uh, Jewish Egyptians uh, uh, in the Middle Ages. That's, that's a later trend. Thank you. Um, even though we are up against the time, I think I do want to ask you at least one more. Um, when you pose the question rescue or ran ransack, um, obviously you're pointing to a, a kind of broader history of the way that the West has interacted with, um, with colonial sites. Um, and so several people are asking whether there has been any effort to do any kind of restitution to restore any of these materials to original locales or original owners or to um, to make up in some way for the sense that the, that the that the items were to put it in a, in an extreme way sort of right. looted. Yeah. Um, uh, not, not a great deal, but uh, there was an effort uh, uh, that came from uh, Jacques Mosseri uh, uh, in the early 20th century uh, to build a Jewish museum uh, in Cairo. And he did reach out to various scholars at Western institutions to ask them if they could send him copies of the fragments. Um, um, and he, he had limited success. Um, <laughs> and so, um, and then recently there's been uh, uh, wonderful projects carried out um, by the um, Oh, let me a uh, uh, drop of milk association in Cairo. Uh, this is an association of um, a few Jewish, a few remaining Jewish uh, residents in Cairo, and some uh, 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 very wonderful uh, Cairo friends and associates, helping them to um, conserve and describe uh, the materials that remain in Cairo because there are there are materials in Cairo. Um, um, but um, as far as and, and, and I know they have links to uh, institutions such as Princeton, um, uh, who have been uh, uh, sort of, you know, wonderful um, uh, sort of help and uh, assistance to them. So that I think there is more of a, a sense of that nowadays of um, trying to see what could be done um, there. Um, but for the most part, I would say no, I would say that there wasn't any sense of, <laughs> uh, of that. Perhaps uh, maybe it was to do with the sense that these were discarded uh, in the first place, you know, buried as done with, uh, and therefore, you know, uh, uh, not needing that sort of uh, level of, um, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that does, it does, it does put it in a different way, <laughs> carrying away sacred artifacts from someone. Right. Yeah. Um, one one last question, sort of bringing us to today and and connecting with um, the aspects of this series that have to do with management and, and librarianship. So, um, wondering first of all if there are if you can talk about efforts now to correct provenance if that's happening um, uh, to and and several people I think who are practitioners who are attending are saying what can we as practitioners do <laughs> to help correct um, um, records of these yes. materials yes. Um, and a related question maybe is are there still a large number of these fragments the ones that were sold off to or, or onward to private collectors are there still a number out in the world that are not held by open institutions that are just in, in private ownership? And is there some effort being made to, to locate those or connect with right. um, uh, So for the first question, I think there are some efforts underway. Um, shout out to the Cat Center Library. Um, I've seen some updates to that, to the website for the collection, which are marvelous, really give now for the first time uh, an account of the sub collections and the people that um, owned them and sold them on to, uh, uh, to Philadelphia. And so uh, that, that's, that's fantastic. So I think there is, I, I, I think where possible, if practitioners can at least um, 
uh, acknowledge that there are sub collections within these collections and 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 list uh, who the suppliers were. That's that's the first step in the right uh, direction. Um, it would be wonderful if there was time and inclination to go digging in the archives of the institution uh, to find out more. But it is a lengthy and complicated process, and so you know I, I understand if that's that's not doable. Um, uh, and the second question is, yes, there are still uh, manuscripts out there, uh, fragments out there, fragments come up for sale on auction from time to time. Um, there are some private owners who have been very generous uh, in allowing access to the ma their materials. Um, and and there, are, there are others for various reasons who, who you know, want to keep them private. And so... Uh, not, not much that can be uh, done there, but maybe if anyone out there is attending this and listening uh, and they would like to share, that would be terrific. I know I know uh, the Friedberg uh, project would probably be uh, extremely pleased to be able to at least scan uh, anything that hasn't been scanned so far. And I know new things are always getting discovered as people right. are piecing together the different parts from different Right, right. Now, absolutely, so. yeah. yeah. All right. Well, with that, I think we do have to stop and let you go. This has been really, really wonderful. I want to thank you again. Um, and I and remind everyone that the video will be online. So if you want to rewatch the um, and, and remember the details, you always can do that. Rebecca, thank you so much. Everyone in the audience, I hope to see see you or see your names in the uh, online a week from today with our lecture on um, post-Holocaust uh, movement of materials from the Soviet bloc to Israel, which is a sort of a, a different directional um, movement of, of materials for other reasons. So thank you so much and take care, everyone.